Hello, and welcome to The Arbitration Conversation. So in this episode, we have the true pleasure to speak with an arbitrator in the Chicago area, Bill McGrath. Bill McGrath, he's a partner with Davis McGrath LLC in Chicago. Um, they do quite a bit of work with intellectual property matters, internet law, and related arbitration, litigation, as well as mediation. He's also an arbitrator with the American Arbitration Association with a robust practice in Chicago. Thank you so much for being here, Bill. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Amy. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, this will be great. What the topic for today we're going to talk about are motions in arbitration. Now, we think about arbitration, right, as being simpler and not quite as litigious, maybe not judicialized in the same way as litigation, but motion practice has become quite common in arbitration. So we wanted to talk with Bill about that issue. So Bill, first of all, could you explain what types of motions you see in your arbitration practice? Sure. Um, you know, really it's not all that different than the type of motions you would see in court. Uh, so for example, um, you know, you will see um, motions regarding discovery, you know, a motion to compel, force the other side to turn over more documents that they're withholding or something like that. Um, I, there have been, I've seen motions for um, dispositive motions, either a motion for summary judgment or partial summary judgment. Um, there's um, uh, motions, um, for example, sometimes the party, one party will want some kind of preliminary relief. Uh, there can be issues of uh, joinder and whether the proper parties are in front of the, the, the tribunal. Um, and it, it's not uncommon also to have a motion uh, dealing with whether you have jurisdiction or whether the question is arbitrable. Um, so they, they come in all shapes and um, sizes. And um, But th those would be the most common ones, a lot of discovery motions that those, are, of course, you really want to uh, try to discourage uh, because, um, y you know, what I personally, what I try to do is um, really force the parties before I even allow them to file a discovery motion to uh, extensively meet and confer and try to work it out and, and we just make it clear that Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I think um, on discovery right, is a I last was, resort. Yeah, one of the main questions, um, yeah, that comes to mind because you think about arbitration as being more efficient, right? And so you want to limit these types of motions. So what what specific tactics or tips do you have for arbitrators when they're being faced with maybe too many litigious motions or or the discovery motions, as you mentioned? Yes, well, there's, there's a couple things you can do. And for, first of all, almost every, well, every arbitration I've been involved in uh, over the years, you always require the parties to seek permission before they can file a motion. And um, particularly if it's a dispositive motion, um, but also even for, for lesser motions. So that's kind of a, uh, an initial a deterrent to the parties if they're going to have to actually ask for permission to file the motion. Um, you, you know, that's a bit of a deterrent, but it also makes them think about the motion and not just randomly file it. You have to come and seek permission. And the arbitrator has, um, you know, broad discretion to say no. And, and when we say they, they uh, need to seek permission, usually you ask them to submit, you know, maybe a three page uh, letter or paper um, setting out the nature of the motion, why this is going to be expeditious to hear the motion, how it's going to help the proceeding rather than hinder it. And then the other side gets uh, three pages in a few days to uh, say why there should not be uh, um, um, a hearing on the motion. So how also you... for uh, just one other point on that and on getting permission, um, especially with dispositive motions, you're gonna require 
a pretty good showing and um, you know, some of the rules even in the AAA even indicate that for a dispositive motion, you should not even allow the filing of a dispositive motion unless the movement has a pretty good likelihood of success on it. Not that you predetermine the motion, but it has to be substantial enough, uh, you know, to move forward. Have you ever, do you often or how often is it that you just simply deny um, a request to present a motion? Uh, I have denied requests to present a motion. Now, you want to be a little careful about that, and that's going to depend on the, um, on, on the type of motion, but um, because you don't want to prevent a party from putting on their best case or putting on a fair, uh, a fair hearing. Um, but usually uh, with a motion, uh, you know, if it's a dispositive motion, there, there's no real harm to the movement by, by denying that, you know, because they still have their chance uh, to present these same arguments at, at a hearing. And as a matter of fact, one of the things you need to consider is kind of the, the, the benefits versus the detriment of, uh, of filing a motion for, say, for summary judgment. Um, is it really going to make it a more efficient proceeding to have the parties collect all their facts, uh, scour depositions, create the exhibits, file briefs, have an argument? You know, at that point, have you really saved any time? You, you might have been able to, uh, I, I know from practice that uh, the cost of a summary judgment motion can be depending on the size of the case, can be quite uh, exorbitant. And maybe, you know, you could have almost tried the case uh, for the same price uh, of what it would cost you to file a dispositive motion. So that's something you want to be careful about. Yeah, that's such a great point, because I think often um, there's this assumption that you're going to be promoting efficiency with these types of dispositive motions. But in fact, you may for efficiency. Right. Do you think the one question that comes to mind as I was listening, do you think when those sorts of dispositive motions are filed that it helps prompt settlement? Um, uh, hard to say. Uh, you know, I don't know that uh, usually if it's, um, again, if we're talking about a dispositive motion, I think the parties are pretty entrenched at that point if they're actually wanting to file uh, a summary judgment motion. Um, you know, that's a very uh, expensive thing for the movement to do if, um, if they just think the other side, if they're just trying to force a settlement, because maybe they can't, you know. Right. Uh, I, I think there is an entrenchment issue if you're in that stage uh, of, yeah. the, of the arbitration. So what kind of advice now kind of flipping to your um, litigator or your um, sort of attorney side um, from the arbitrator yeah. side. So as an attorney, what kind of advice do you have for attorneys when considering sort of when they should and should not file a motion, especially when we're talking about dispositive motions as we are currently? Right. Well, okay. With regard to a dispositive motion, again, you want to carefully consider the cost benefit analysis before you even raise the question. But let's say um, you have a, a, a very uh, you know, clear cut uh, legal issue. Um, that would be the only time you want to file a, a, a motion for summary judgment or a dispositive motion. Um, because any arbitrator is going to be worried on a dispositive motion that after, after you make a ruling, if your ruling is that the motion is granted and the case is over, um, you're going to worry about uh, the possibility of a vacature that you have uh, denied uh, uh, one party uh, a chance to provide evidence and have a full hearing um, 
and resulting in the in prejudice to them. So that's something that arbitrators worry about sometimes. And and the vacature rule explicitly mentions you know denial of allowing or refusing or a party to um, put in evidence fair have a fair chance to put in all their evidence. So even uh, and if you are allowing a, um, a dispositive motion. You want to make sure if one side wants some discovery or more discovery in order to respond, say, for the, to the motion for summary judgment, you, you're going to want to allow that um, because otherwise, again, you could be charged with, uh, you know, denying uh, one oh, party yeah. the, the uh, opportunity to gather evidence. So that's going to be, you have to tread very carefully in that, in that right, area. Right, right. Uh, yeah. on, on, on less consequential motions, you know, it's just um, a, a balancing. Is it, uh, you know, if you're the attorney, is this going to slow the proceedings down very much um, on discovery or motions to compel? How important is the evidence? Do you really need it? Uh, because, you know, as arbitrators, we want to, we want to keep discovery also to a minimum, um, not to exclude it altogether, but you, you want to keep it efficient and as, as pared down as can be done while still keeping fairness involved. So, um, you know, the, the attorneys have to think about that, that arbitrators um, really don't want discovery motions. Um, they're, they're probably going to uh, allow a certain amount of discovery. And uh, so if there's really a compelling reason to, um, that you know, somebody's refusing to cooperate or something like that, you know, that's fine. But again, um, you're, gonna want to, you, you're gonna want to show the arbitrator that you've made every possible overture and effort to meet and confer with the other side. And you've tried everything and they're still uh, refusing, so uh, then you you should be able to file the motion. Right. Well, these have all been really good tips. I think it's really important. A couple key takeaways um, on looking at whether or not it's just a legal, a clear cut legal issue. That's a good rule of thumb when thinking about whether to file a dispositive motion. And secondly, I think really good advice on weighing the cost and benefits, especially when you're talking about discovery motions. Um, you certainly don't want to exhaust the arbitrators <laughs> before, right. before you even get to the hearing. Right. Well, Bill, thank you so much for taking the time with us today. I really appreciate it. This has been really informative. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. It was a pleasure.